Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Matthew 3, verse 3. Good morning, everyone. And a special welcome to anyone who is visiting with us today on this Mission Awareness Sunday. This morning, the Reverend Dr. Catherine Clark will be leading us in worship. Her husband, the Reverend Dr. Ian Clark, will also be participating in the service as well. Dr. Clark is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church in Canada and Professor Emerita Dalla School of Public Health, Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto. As both a minister and an academic, she has worked in many international settings with street women and children, political prisoners and dissidents and their families. She participated in the evacuation of refugees from Rwanda, worked with refugees and displaced people in Kenya, and was one of the organizers of a major evacuation of street children in Nairobi. Her international health research has been based in China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Kenya, Botswana, Palestine, Israel, and many other countries. She has served as the interim moderator, served on general assembly committees, and has worked consistently for the church for several years. Dr. Clark, welcome back to our pulpit again. Call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God has given us life and hope. We praise God for our Savior, Jesus Christ. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. To God be the glory, hymn number 350.
to God be the glory. But yet, when the first disciples re recognized and realized the, the story of the, the, re the resurrection, they retreated behind closed doors, and it was behind closed doors that the Spirit came to them. So inside this sanctuary and behind the closed doors, God's Spirit blows on us. Through the closed hearts, God's Spirit works in us. And so in God's time, we come to worship and to wonder and to be blessed. Let us pray. Almighty and all-loving God, as your people gathered behind locked doors, drawn together through their grief and worrying what comes next, you came in their midst and you brought your blessing. In our many seasons of life, in hope and fear, in joy and in despair, you come into our midst and you offer that same blessing, peace be with you. As we gather this morning, having shared our hallelujahs for Easter and shared our the silence of the death, for the silence of death overcome, as we hold our imaginations in common, come into our midst and renew that blessing. Peace be with you. Be assured your presence surrounds us. Assure us that that presence surrounds us and hold us with, with all that burdens us and let us thankfully come before you. Come into our midst and renew that blessing so that we may know that peace be with us. And so help us to be with you, your risen son, here and now as we present our prayers of confession and pray together, saying, Love Lord God. busyness get in the way of reaching out to others who are hurting and need a compassionate word. Too often we fail to be positive in our relationships and shine your blessing in our lives. Too often we nurture past hurts and bind it to the needs of others. Forgive us, dear God, we pray. Free us from the bonds of sin and set us on the path you are calling us to follow. We pray for forgiveness in the name of the Lord Amen. Know that God keeps promises of faith, that God forgives our past failings, and offers us strength to know and to share the peace of God's love and of God's promise. And so we say thanks be to God. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, accept the offering that we bring, use it for your good purpose in and through the church, and use what we, who we are and what we are, so that all may manifest your glory and your presence in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
we're going to read a story from the beginning of, of the history of the church. Peter and John and the apostles were brought before the high priest and before his council. Acts chapter 5, verse 27. When they had brought them in, they had them to stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet here you are and have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed and by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as the leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so the Holy Spirit to whom God has given us to those who obey him. Here ends that incident from the book of Acts. And from the book of Revelation, we read these things. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Thanks be to God for these readings from Scripture. And our gospel reading is from John chapter 20, verse 19 to 31. John 20, 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were, clocked for, were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen and me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. 
This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is a prayer, and it takes us through the Easter message. Number 233, Were You There?
were you there? Well, we're here. But it's the same thing. We're here in the spirit. Two weeks ago, do you remember we had palm branches and we waved them? We had lots of hope for the coming of Easter, the resurrection of our Lord. And one week ago, we celebrated Easter. Wasn't that fun? Easter, we, we were so glory, hallelujah, over the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who defeated sin and death once and for all time. But today's the week after Easter events. And many of us, along with Jesus' disciples, are asking ourselves, now what? What's next? How can we follow such a glorious moment in the church as we witnessed last Sunday when we celebrated Jesus' resurrection and defeat of sin and death? How can we hold the Easter excitement in our hearts so that we can live lives worthy of Jesus' sacrifice? What can top this? What's next? You might be surprised if I told you that this week, the week after Jesus' death and resurrection, is the most important time for the church. It's the most important time because it's the time for making disciples, for empowering disciples to carry the Easter message throughout the world and into the centuries following. The first disciples understood that there would be no future, no remembrance of Jesus, no fulfilling of God's plan for humanity, no presence of Jesus in the present if they didn't proclaim the good news message throughout the world. And so today we're sitting in this church, 21 centuries after Jesus' appearance to the frightened disciples because of those early believers who passed on the message. So this is an important time. It's a time to learn about hope and commitment and how we can carry Christ's message and his church into the future. An early Christian theologian, August of Hippo, Augustine of Hippo, better known as St. Augustine, proclaimed that Christians are Easter people. When we believe in the resurrection promise of Jesus Christ, when we follow with sincere penance and good works of caring and sharing with others, we live like Easter has made a difference in our lives. We are Easter people because we belong to God and we share that message with others through our love and through our service. If Easter has made no impact on what we believe and how we live our lives, how we treat our family, friends, and neighbors, then we have made an implicit decision to follow the way of the world. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross means nothing more than an incident in history. But here's the good news of Easter. Even though we ignore God and follow other paths, God does not abandon us. We are still Easter people because we belong to God. God continues to offer us endless opportunities for, for, to fulfill our call as Easter people when we repent and try to change our ways to follow more closely the path to abundant and eternal life as Jesus leads us on. The resurrection of Christ gives us the gift of starting, starting over and over again, trying each time. And there's no limit to the number of times we can start over and try again. So let's look at those fearful disciples hiding from the authorities behind locked doors as they asked each other, what do we do with our faith and our dreams now? What's next? Then, as if locked doors were no barrier to Jesus, he stood among them and said, peace, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the power and strength to continue my work, to bring life to those who are dying in their sin while they can yet live. Jesus' mission that evening was to transform the excitement of Easter into God's purpose for humanity to transform bleak and despairing disciples into a powerful force for expressing God's will and God's purpose for life for all generations. 
But what is God's purpose for God's creation? Micah chapter 6, verse 8 tells us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God, to serve God by caring for others and all of God's creation. And that means the created world, our environment, the people in it, the animals in it, by caring for all. From that early start, the church has survived into this generation. And yet, the church is only one generation away from extinction. Our children and their children will only know Christ through the witness of this generation. Our witness, as we pass on that early hope from the first Easter people. Let's go back to the gospel story. Once the disciples had seen the risen Christ, they were happy and reassured in their hope. They were eagerly planning their strategy for taking Jesus' message throughout the world. Everything seemed to be going according to plan. But then Thomas enters the picture. Thomas had missed Jesus when he first appeared to the other disciples, and he wasn't about to take their word for it that Jesus had risen from the dead. He wanted proof for himself. Now I have to confess to you, I have a soft spot for Thomas. He doesn't blindly follow the crowd, blindly accepting their authority, but seeks his own proof to affirm his faith and his actions. Again, Jesus entered the room through locked doors and offered Thomas the proof he needed. He became one of Jesus' most committed disciples carrying the gospel message to China and the Indian subcontinent, where he was responsible for converting many people until he was martyred. Thomas's unfair claim to fame is a nickname, Doubting Thomas, right? Okay. But in fact, he's one of Jesus' most committed disciples. When Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem, the disciples thought it would be certain death for all of them. But it was Thomas who said, then let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas was the first person to explicitly, explicitly acknowledge the divinity of Christ when he said, my Lord and my God. No doubt there. But isn't it funny how we remember negative things about people? rather than the good. There are many important messages in the scripture lessons for today, and I'm going to look at three strong messages as we explore how Jesus makes us disciples. The first strong message is that Jesus makes disciples in different ways and by different routes. No one way to discipleship is better than another. Persistence in seeking Christ is all that's required. And as the story of Thomas teaches us, Jesus does not criticize or condemn doubt in his followers. Doubt's good because it can prompt truth-seeking. And when truth dawns, believers can be strong in what they know and what they believe. Doubt is a way of taking our faith seriously. A second message is that there are many paths to the destination where Jesus is leading us. God knows that everyone must come to faith in their own way and at their own pace. For some, it's a moment of insight. For others, it may come through a difficult experience with or family or friends that show Christ's influence and power in their lives. For others, it's a lifetime struggle, but a struggle never given up. Everyone believes differently, and everyone comes to know Christ differently. And the third message, the best of all, is that God never gives up on us. And we are given many opportunities to know Christ through our own experience, what we've learned from life as we face good times and as we face challenges. Thomas is an example of this. Even though he was disappointed and sad after the death of Jesus, he stayed with the disciples, and he was given the kind of experience he needed to believe. God knows you can't be bullied into belief. 
It doesn't work if you try to scare people into believing or argue with them or promise them all sorts of miracles if only they had stronger faith. That's not how God works. God is patient, always ready to accept us when we are ready to surrender our will to God's will. Jesus encourages us to question our beliefs so that we can find integrity between what we believe and how we act. We are given freedom in our faith, and while there is life, we are given time to know the presence of Christ in our life and to find ways of expressing discipleship in our own community. Let's see what that looks like. I want to tell you about one of my favorite stories. It's about an Easter person who had many doubts. Julia Ward Howe was a Christian woman who tried her best to help others and live by the golden rule. But she was consumed by hatred of slavery and lack of human rights and dignity for all people. Try as she might, she didn't know what she could do to make a difference. When her dear friend John Brown was killed by slave traders, they made up a barroom song to mock his death. I'm sure you've heard it. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, etc. And it was sung to the tune we're going to use for the last hymn we're going to sing today at the end of the service. Now, John Brown was a farmer, a man of peace who worked to free slaves. He didn't deserve his fate. Julia Howe decided to redeem the song and write new words to the barroom tune. But she didn't know how to do it. She didn't know how to be consistent to her faith in God and her faith in the ultimate good of human beings. And so she wrestled with this. One night she couldn't sleep. She tossed and turned wondering what she could do, what she should do to change the world she found herself in. Suddenly, she had what she described as a flash of light, a flash of insight. It wasn't what she could do. It was what God would do through her. She had to wait for God's timing. In that moment, she later wrote, she saw the glory of the coming of the Lord. She jumped out of bed and quickly wrote the hymn, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That hymn quickly became the rallying cry of the Union forces who won the war and abolished slavery in the United States. Julia Ward Howe was an Easter person. Her gift lives on today because she trusted that God would work through her to achieve God's purpose for her. All of us are Easter people. And all of us have the same opportunity to trust what God is doing through us and what can God can do if we are faithful, persistent, and aware of God's presence in our lives. Jesus tells us what Easter people do, and it seems so simple to live as Easter people by helping where and when we can, by treating everyone as equal, by serving God by serving others. It's a simple, simple way. For me, the readings for today and the stories of saints past and present lead to this moment we are, where we are worshiping God right now, right now in this building, building on the excitement of Easter resurrection. They show us how Jesus called disciples so that the message of salvation, new life and new possibilities would be proclaimed in that first generation and throughout the centuries that followed unto this pre present generation, the here and now. And so the baton is pass passed on. The baton is passed on to you and to me. Jesus is still making disciples calling you and calling me to take the gospel message, to live the gospel message into the next generation. The church and Christ depend on us. So what's next? What do we do after Easter? When we hear the word of God is written in scripture and witnessed in the lives of saints, past and present, we are encouraged to be Easter people pleasing to God, sharing our vision, love, and hope with others through caring, through sharing, 
and through service. The task for this Sunday after Easter is to transform the Easter message into a way of living as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, living as Easter people. Remember, Christ's church is just one generation away from extinction. It's up to us, Christ's Easter people. God is patient, and God is waiting, waiting to breathe new life into you and into me over and over again as we call upon him to stand in his risen power to strengthen our discipleship to help us proclaim the good news in the way we live our lives and to give us strength and help as we live our easter journey and we say thanks be to god amen We offer our prayers to the one who shares our difficulties, who shares our lives, who shares, us, shares in the past and the present and the future. And so we pray. Almighty and all loving God, we give you thanks for the simple things of life, for nourishing food which is readily available, for roofs over our head to keep us safe, for access to health care for leaderships in our community, for families and for support, and for a faith community to share in our lives and to support us in love. Help us, eternal spirit of love, never to take for granted all that we have. We thank you for the inspiration of the disciples who emerged from behind hidden doors and walked and acted in faith and shared all the possibilities in which you, Jesus Christ, called for them to engage. We thank you for, so we thank you for people of faith down through the centuries who similarly have shared their faith and showed it in practical ways to those around them so that they could be touched and affected by that faith and by your presence. We thank you for people around us who share and work who share in worship, that this church and this congregation will continue to walk and to act in faith as Christ has called us to do. These prayers we make in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who stood in that upper room and changed the lives of Thomas and the disciples and now changes even us. Resurrection, love in action who is and who was and will be, we offer our prayers for people who sit around us, for people who join us online, for people who have already worshiped long ago, even while we were still sleeping. They were awake in the far off east. And we pray for people in the far west who have yet to see the dawn of this day and who will continue uplifting prayers as the world turns around. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray for your children, as our children as they return to school and the, for the final term of this year. Bless teachers, bless the community of, that is around them. We pray for older students whose exams are still on the horizon in school and college and university. May they have strength for this final task before the summer break. And so we pray for teachers. May they know fulfillment in the, and joy in their task. We pray for people who we know and we love, whose good we pray for this day. We pray for lives, for those people whose lives seem to be straightforward, and for them we give you thanks. For the people who await medical investigations, we give, we give you our worries, our concerns. For the people who are frail and whose lives are limited, we give you our concern. For people who have lost 
we have lost by the past of their passing, we entrust into your care. And so we pray for our church, for vision and for strength to find a way to serve and to live in the light of your resurrection power. We pray for our communities, our country, our world. We pray for peacemakers, peacekeepers, who reach beyond the, the boundaries and offer hope, the hand of hope and of understanding, a hand of peace. We pray for heal, healers who tend to the wounds of ancient hurts. We pray for justice bringers who uncover hidden abuse to enable justice and healing and in a, in a different way of living. All these prayers and the prayers that we're still locked in our hearts and in our minds, we pray that we offer them in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Perfecter of our faith, who taught us when we pray together to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Thank you for leading us in worship this morning. And on behalf of Session and the congregation, I'd like to thank you both for being with us for this month of April through the Easter season. We hope that we'll see you back again, and may God be with you both. Thank you. Uh, the April session news is in the insert in the bulletin again this week. Uh, there is an also another insert on behalf of, on, on the back of the uh, session news, and it's relative to the mission and outreach fundraiser for the Richmond Hill Community Food Bank. We are doing uh, a collection of non-perishable food items, financial contributions, if anyone can help do that, and we'll start next Sunday, May the 1st, and it will run for the month of May. Next Sunday, May the 1st, Jim McDonald will be leading us in worship. We will now sing our last hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
go into the world remembering that we are Easter people, remembering and, and that we have to present his presence in this, his world. And with that, we are commissioned to go and to love and to serve. And we go with the blessing of the coming of the Lord. God is with us now. Go with the blessing of God as creator, as redeemer, as sustainer. May that blessing be with you and those you love wherever they are, this day and always. Thank you.